Good evening, everyone. I'm Varshini ST from Sundari. Uh, I'm currently pursuing my MSc from USR Karnataka. I wholeheartedly welcome you all for my first plant pathology class on history, bacteria, and virus. And in the rest of the classes, I'll be covering fungi and diseases of curry, frabi crops, and other horticultural crops. So here, I'll be touching all the basic as aspects. And uh, if you find difficulties or questions or queries at any time, you can interrupt me at any point of the time and you can, you are very much free to ask any doubts. If I'm clear, I'll be answering at the time and you can put it in the chat box also. If there is any questions also later also, I'll, I'll be able to answer. Okay. Is that, is my voice is audible to all of you? Yeah. And the voice is audible, can start. Okay, okay. So in today's session, we'll be discussing about introduction and history of plant pathology. Then we shall be moving into the phytobacteriology and phytovirology. Come, let's discuss it one by one. Coming to the introduction, what do you mean by plant pathology? Yes, it's the study of plant diseases. So any plant disease to occur, we must have the three important component. Yes, it's a virulent pathogen and a susceptible host and a favorable environmental condition. So these pathogens or the organisms which have the ability to cause the disease and make the host or a plant susceptible. So when you start studying about these pathogens, we call it as a etiology. So what does this pathogen will do to the plant? It will actually harm the plant and also derive the nutrition from it. But on the other hand, when you compare it with other parasites, those parasites have only the ability to take up the nutrients without harming the plants. So we can say that pathogens, all the pathogens are parasites, but all the parasites are not pathogens. So any virulent pathogen means it has the ability to cause the disease, whereas a virulent means it don't cause the disease. So next, moving on to the host. So what is this susceptible host? Susceptible host means it's a plant which is actually invaded or affected by a pathogen. And third important parameter I said is about the environment. There must be a favorable environment which is actually coding for the disease to occur in a plant. So what are those parameters? Yes, it may be a temperature, moisture, or relative humidity, wind, rainfall, all these factors will actually favor for the disease to occur. So when there is a virulent pathogen, a susceptible host and a favorable environment, there comes the disease. And that's what we call it as a disease triangle. Nextly, Stevens and Van der Plank still recognized another two factors, that is time and human interference. Some diseases will occur at particular time. They may be season specific, or sometimes even the humans are also very much included in causing the disease. Like they may bring the disease sample from other countries that we call it as an introduction or through the implements. So there is a human interference. So when these two factors will occur, we call it as a disease pyramid. So there were already existment of three factors. And now we are adding these two factors and we call it as a disease pyramid, which was given by Stevens and Van der Plank. And now we shall be discussing some of the important basic terminologies. Yes. What is a symptom? When you start observing the visible effect of the pathogen on the diseased plant, it is called as a symptom and group of symptom we call it as a syndrome. Whereas sign is presence of pathogen. 
For example, if you start observing a ooze or a bacterial ooze, we call it as a sign. Or sometimes you are observing the white mycelia in case of downy mildew. So these are all the signs we say. Have you ever thought, why is it very important to learn about the plant diseases? Yes, it's because that these devastating diseases can cause the famines, leading to the starvation and death of the millions of people, which is because of a plant disease. Yes, it is very true that in 1845, there was Irish famine in Earl Island, which was caused by Phytophthora infestans. As in case of India, we know that it is the rice, which is the staple food. But in case of Ireland, it was actually potato, which was the staple food. Almost 80% of the population were dependent on this potato. But all of a sudden, there was a late blight of potato, which caused severe rotting of the potato. And there was a death of 1 million people and around 1.5 billion people migrated to Canada and US. So this late blight of potato is caused by Phytophthora infestans. And this was being given by Antony D. Bari, whom we call him as a father or founder of plant pathology. He is the main scientist who told that it is actually Phytophthora infestans, which is causing the late blight of potato. And the second most important famine is Bengal famine, which took place in India. So this took place in India. We know that this Bengal famine is caused up by brown leaf spot. This is caused by Helminthosporium oryzae. So we were actually importing the rice at that time from the Burma. But Japan attacked the Burma and we cannot import the rice also. And in this Bengal and Punjab region were also attacked by this Helminthosporium. So this caused 40 to 90% of the reduction in the yield, which led to the famine. As you can observe the symptoms in the picture. Moving on to the coffee rust, which was caused by Hemelia vasculitis. This orange colored pustules you can observe on the leaves, which actually changed the whole cropping pattern of coffee into the tea in case of Sri Lanka. Whereas in case of downy mildew of grapes, this is caused by Plasmophora viticola. And this was being told by Millardate and Plankon in the year 1878. It was actually P.A. Millardate who found out the best solution, that is a Bodiax mixture. It is a mixture of copper sulfate and lime against this downy mildew of grapes. These are the important famines. Now, let us remember the important contributions of science. Yes, it was Surpal who told about the symptoms and control measures of plant diseases in his book, Brikshayur Veda. Whereas the P.A. Michaeli, who is a renowned mycologist who told that the fungi will produce spore and reproduce by spores, was told by P.A. Michaeli and he is the father of mycology. Whereas John Needham, who told about the weed seed gall nematode. That's why he is the father of seed pathology. Whereas the binomial nomenclature was given by Carinus Linnaeus. And the tillage scientist gave the seed treatment for the wheat bunt. Now, J.G. Kun, who gave the book Diseases of Cultivated Crops, Their Causes and Control. And first time the bacterial nature of fire blight of apple in case of Ervinia amylovoda was given by P.J. Burrell. There are main four basic principles of plant pathology is coach postulate. If you want to say that any organism is pathogen, it must prove this coach postulate. Then what is coach postulate? It says that the pathogen must be associated with the diseased plant. 
and secondly you must be able to isolate the pathogen and do the subculturing and thirdly it must be able to inoculate to a healthy plant and fourthly when you inoculate it to a healthy plant it must show the same symptoms shown by a diseased plant so when an organism shows all these postulates then we can say that it is a pathogen now it's time for the discussion can anyone answer this question please which of the following statement is not true for post postulate can i get the answer choose the correct answer from the options c hello option c it's option a which of the following is not true yes madam c and d are ah uh, c and d are not true the pure culture will produce the disease when inoculated into resistant animal no we are inoculating it to a healthy animal and the d says that the pure culture will not produce the disease but it must produce the disease to prove it as a pathogen so the answer is a that means c and d options are wrong so this is the importance of course postulate this is actually a paper from jrf 2020 so please concentrate on this course postulates moving on it was ej butler who is called as the father of indian plant pathology and the kc mehta who gave the paxinia path paxinia path means the unidirectional movement of viridos spores from himalayan foothills to the nilgiri and palani hills so this was given by kc mehta and we know about the internally seed borne blue smut of weed disease so this against this disease the management that is solar heat treatment was given by lutra and sapta whereas the fungi and plant disease book was given by mundkar whereas fungi and diseases in plant was given by butler e f smith who is called as the father of phytobacteriology and the scientist who told that viruses can cannot cause the disease sorry virus can cause the disease with the help of a poisonous fluid called as contagium vivum fluidum so this was given by bejerini who is called as the father of plant virology and the great scientist who got nobel prize for the crystallization of virus is stanley and the virus is made up of nucleic acid and protein that is nucleoprotein nature was given by borden and perry these are the important scientists to come in pathology now it's time for the match the following please match list 1 with the list 2 i want the answers please respond
Can anyone answer this? Okay. You have responded in the chat box. Yes, it's the answer to that is Antonidi Bari, late blight of potato, bejerining viruses, baril, bacterial disease, butlo, imperial mycologist, and flow, gene for gene hypothesis in linseed rust. Okay, now we shall be discussing the classification of plant disease. You can classify the diseases based on crops. For example, downy mildew of grapes or blasting case of rice or sarcospora leaf spot in chili. So different crops, you can classify them. Or on the affected plant parts. For example, if you're observing the symptoms on leaf, it is a leaf disease, fruit disease, or stem, or if you're appearing any diseases on the root, it is a root disease. Or else you can go for the source of inoculum. That means if the from where the pathogen is actually coming. If it is coming from the soil, it is a soil bore or a seed bore, or it may come from the air, which is we call it as a airborne. So usually they say the wilts that is drying, drooping, it is a soil bore. Whereas loose smut of wheat, we know that it is a internally seed bone, whereas the rust uridospores are airborne. Or else you can also classify on extent of disease, that means localized or systemic. Localized means you can see the symptoms only on the affected plant pot. For example, the spots, whereas the systemic means you can observe the symptoms on whole plant. For example, downy mildew. There will be downy growth, yellowing, and shredding of whole plant. So this is a systemic disease. Like this, you can start classifying. Sometimes you can classify on geographic distribution. For example, endemic diseases means these are the diseases which are very much specific for the location. They are always appearing at a particular place. The best example is wart of potato in Darjeeling. And this is an important quarantine controlled disease. So they are trying to control it, not to spread to other states. This we call it as an endemic disease. Whereas epidemic means there is a periodic occurrence in senior form for a major area. For example, you have acres together of wheat area. And all of a sudden, there is a severe rust. So in case of major areas, if it is coming in a severe form, we say it as a epidemic. But in case of pandemic disease, it can spread from country to country. It will come in a sudden severe form and it will spread in a short time. And the very good example, the third picture, late blight of potato. Whereas sporadic means it always comes in patches or irregular intervals. And the good example is fourth picture that is Udbatta disease of rice which occurs only at the patches or based on the symptoms like if you are observing the spots only it is based on the spots or if you are seeing some rough cocky growth it is canker whereas drying and drooping it is a wilt like based on the symptoms also you can classify or I told that it is a study of pathology means or uh, the study of etiology where we study the pathogens so based on that also you can classify like there is no rule that only biotic organisms should cause the disease. Even non-living organisms can also cause the disease. And the very good example is if there is any high temperature or low moisture or any deficiency of nutrients, that can also cause for the disease. And the very good example is zinc deficiency, which leads to chiral disease in case of pandemic. And sometimes you're observing black heart in case of potato. It's because of the low or low oxygen and increased temperature. And sometimes you may observe the blossom and rot of tomato. It's because of the calcium deficiency. So all these comes under abiotic. Whereas mesobiotic means that neither living nor non-living. 
and the bridge which acts for living and non living is virus in case of virus disease you observe the leaf curling stunting mosaic symptoms and mottling whereas the living organism such as bacteria may cause spots and fungi will cause the blights and algae the very important this is that is red rust of mango and protozoa will cause phloem necrosis of coffee and in case of nematodes you see the galls and knots in case of roots okay now we shall be discussing about the phytobacteriology about the bacteria which infect the plants so what is this bacteria bacteria are the prokaryotic microorganisms whose size vary from 0.2 to 1.5 micrometer in diameter and 3 to 5 micrometer in length you can classify them based on different aspects and the very first aspect is based on shape as you can observe here if it is a rod shape it is bacillus if it is a spherical we call it as coccus if it is a comma shape it is vibrio if it is spiral we call it as spirillum flagellar spiral we call it as spirochete and if the cocci is single we call it as cocci if there are two that is diplococci if they are in chain we call it as streptococci if there are four in number we call it as tetrad eight in number it is sarsina and if you are observing any grape like cluster we call it as staphylococci you can also classify based on flagella we know that flagella is the motility organ if bacteria doesn't have any flagella as you can observe here it is atrichous almost all the cocci are atrichous whereas monotrichous means it is having a single polar flagella here usually the xanthomonas bacteria will be having single polar flagella whereas amphi means single flagella at both the ends very good example is pseudomonas whereas cephalo means tuft of flagella at both the ends whereas in case of peritrichus you can observe here all over the body of bacteria there is flagella and the very good example is ervinia which comes in the peritrichus whereas lofo means tuft of flagella only at one end an example is pseudomonas flores this is about the flagella classification this is a pictorial representation of bacteria showing different organelles so this is the flagella you are observing here this is the pill line the outermost layer is capsule within which you will find the plasma membrane then comes the cell wall then comes the cytoplasm then comes the organelles such as dna and uh, cytoplasmic inclusion mesosomes ribosomes etc so now let's discuss it one by one we know that outermost cell wall is a very important organ for the protection do you know what it is made up of yes it is made up of a important murin murin or we also call it as a peptidoglycan peptidoglycan is made up of n acetyl glucose amine and n acetyl muramic acid so these two are linked by amino acid chain and usually in gram positive bacteria there is 85% of peptidoglycan and 10% is tcoic acid whereas in case of gram negative bacteria it is only 10% which is peptidoglycan and the rest is lipoproteins and lipopolysaccharide so this is an important protective organ whereas cell membrane is a selectively permeable membrane which don't allow the toxins to enter into bacteria whereas the capsule protects the bacteria against desiccation and in case of ralstonia and ervinia this capsule is very much required for virulence it is actually a exopoly saccharide it is a slimy exopolysaccharide 
if a bacteria is not having the cell wall we call it as protoplast and if the bacteria has a damaged cell wall we call it as a spheroblast and what do you mean by mesosomes these are the principal sites of respiration and reproduction and you all know that ribosome cells in protein cells and coming to the nucleus it is actually dna which is a genetic material and you all know flagella helps in motility which has three structure that is base hook and filament coming to fimbriae which helps in antiphagocytosis and pili helps in conjugation there are certain special special bacterias called as bacillus in clostridium which produce the heat resistant spores called as endospores and the very important constitution is dipicolinic acid and calcium so these two are the major components here as you can observe in the picture these endospores have a core here within which the inner membrane germ cell wall and this is the cortex which is covered by outer membrane which is still covered by a coat these endospores are heat resistant for one and a half hours and there are certain bacteria called as l form bacteria so these are the bacteria which don't has any cell wall and the good example is pectobacterium keratoderm coming to the reproduction initially we will be discussing the asexual reproduction we know that it is binary fission in case of binary fission the bacteria will start multiplying with the help of septum formation as you can observe in the picture here this green color is the septum which actually divides the bacteria now once after the septum formation the bacterial chromosome will start dividing and it will move from the parental cell into the daughter cell so here the new daughter cell will be formed binary fission occurs by septum formation and nuclear division and formation of new daughter cell whereas in case of budding this is the parental cell which will start producing the outgrowth or we call it as a protrumbens and uh, it will start multiplying or uh, dividing its own chromosome and that divided chromosome will reach into the outgrowth so that outgrowth will start separating from the parental cell and behaves as a new bacteria this is called as budding in case of bacteria coming to the sexual reproduction there are mainly three aspects here conjugation transformation and transduction coming to the conjugation this was actually given by lederberg and tatum in equally so what is this conjugation so here actually this is the donor means it is a male whereas recipient means female this green color you are observing no it is the f plasmid or fertility plasmid we say so this is present in male or donor so this f plasmid or fertility plasmid will start dividing and multiplying and it reaches into the female so once this fertility factor reaches the female this female will get converted into male then we call it as a conjugation so reaching of fertility plasmid from male to female and converting the female to male we call it as a conjugation to bring about the recombination in case of bacteria whereas transformation means we are sending the dna fragments externally into the bacterial zone see here either we can use the dna fragments or the plasmid i'll be explaining you can also add dna fragments here if the bacteria takes it then that dna fragment will integrate with the bacterial chromosome and once it integrates with the bacterial chromosome it leads to a stable transformation but not always we can see some stable transformation there will be unstable transformation also so then we can go for this plasmid we can also use plasmid as a vector 
for bringing about the recombination. So we can insert this plasmid into the bacterial chromosome and bring about the stable transformation. So transformation is all about the using DNA fragments of plasmid as a genetic source to bring about the genetic recombination. Now it's time for the question and answer. Can I get the answer for this? Please respond. This is a question from JRF 2021. Yes, it's A. Both the statements are true. Okay, next coming to the third mechanism that is transduction. So here we are using a bacteriophage. What do you mean by bacteriophage? Bacteriophage means the virus which is infecting the bacteria. So that we call it as a bacteriophage. And this was being given by Lederberg and Zinder in 1951. So this was given by Lederberg and Zinder in Salmonella typhi. I told that this bacteriophage is a virus which infects the bacteria. As you can observe in the picture here, first the phage is infecting the bacteria. Then the virus particles will start multiplying and also it degrades the bacterial chromosome. And in the third picture, you can see that there is only one phage which is having both viral genome and bacterial genome. So that will bring the transduction. See here, when that phage is actually infecting other bacteria, it is having the ability to transfer both bacterial and viral genome into another bacteria. This we call it as a transduction. Bringing the recombination by using a bacteriophage is called as a transduction given by Lederberg and Zinder. And there are mainly three phylums in bacteria, firmicutes. This uh, firmicutes have almost gram positive bacteria with strong cell wall. And a very good example is Bacillus and Clostridium, which produces endospores, I said. And coming to actinobacteria, they have the high G plus C content. For example, Clavibacter, Actinomyces, whereas proteobacteria, almost all the gram negative bacteria like Azotobacter, Azospirulum. Here you can find the examples like alpha proteobacteria, beta proteobacteria, gamma proteobacteria, delta and epsilon proteobacteria. So this is all about the bacteria. Now let us discuss about the phytovirology. It is very surprising that tulip flowers were very popular for the beauty of their variegated flowers. But this tulip calibrating was proved to be a viral disease tulipomania. So this was being proved by Carolus Clusius in the year 1576. So it was Carolus Clusius who told that these variegations are actually a disease. We call it as a tulipomania. And particularly, this tulipomania is caused by potiviridae group of viruses. This potiviridae causes tulipomania. I told that virus is a nucleo. Protein. That means it has nucleic acid and protein. And the first virus discovered was tobacco mosaic virus by Ivanovsky in the year 1892. This virus comes from the Latin word venom, means poison. Now it's time for the question. Please let me know the answer. 
This has been appeared in JRF 2022 paper. Option B. Okay, good. Then what is a viron? Viron is the infectious form of the virus. And this nucleic acid is actually having 5 to 40% of either DNA or the RNA. And in this pictorial representation, you can see that the central region is nucleocapsid. And this is covered by a lipid bilayer envelope. And that protruded brown color regions, we call it as a spikes. So we call that as a spike protein, which is layered by lipid layer. We call it as a lipid envelope. And once this lipid enveloped proteins, we call it as a lipovirus. If any virus is having this lipid bilayer envelope, we call them as lipovirus. And this capsid is made up of many small units called as capsomeres. Then what is this satellite virus? Satellite virus is a small RNA virus. And this small RNA virus must require a helper virus for its multiplication. Without the helper virus, the satellite virus cannot survive. It must always be in association with the helper virus. I told that bacteriophage is a virus which is infecting the bacteria. This was actually given by D. Herrill in the year 1917. As you can observe in the picture, this is a nucleocapsid which is covered by a protein coat. And this is the collar region which is connecting this head to the tail fibers. And the middle region is sheath which ends in the base plates. And the base plates will start with the tail fibrils, ends in the spikes. So this is how the bacteriophage attacks the lung. Sorry, bacteria. This is the growth phases. There are mainly two phases here, lytic and lysogenic. In case of lytic cycle, the phage will attack the bacteria. In the first step, you can see that the phage is attached to the bacteria. Whereas in case of second step, it starts penetrating and it is transferring all its genetic material into the bacteria. Then it starts using the bacterial host machineries for its own multiplication. And once it starts multiplying, it will go for the assembly. Assembly means the nucleic acid will be surrounded with the protein coat. And after the assembly, it will break open the bacterial cell and comes out. The phages will get released. So this we call it as a lytic cycle. Since it virulently breaks open the bacterial cell, it is called as a virulent phage. But in contrast, in case of lysogenic cycle, the viral genome will integrate with the host genome. Here you can see the integration of viral genome with the bacterial genome. Once it starts integrating, we call it as a prophage. Here it has two options. Either it can integrate with the bacterial chromosome and starts producing the recombinants or it can revert back. As you can see here, it can revert back to the lytic cycle. It can revert back and break open the bacterial cell wall like this and the phages can come out. So here there are two options and this was discovered by Andre Lov. It's the time for the question. Now please let me know the answer. If you have any doubts, you can interrupt me at any time. <coughs> can I get the answer?
Yes, it's the answer A. Good. Can I get the answer for this? Yes, it's profage. Okay, good. Now we know that tobacco mosaic virus was the first virus discovered. And uh, it was Giger and Stram who told that RNA was the genetic material here. And viroid means it doesn't have any protein content, but it has the nucleic acid. Whereas in contrast, prion means it don't have the nucleic acid, it has only protein. So you can remember it like P for P. Prions means only protein, no nucleic acid. And lastly, it's virno. That means nucleic acid of virus, which is surrounded by the protein of host. So this is all about today's class. If you have any queries or doubts, please let me know now. Okay, thank you.